This is Karen with NewClevelandRadio.net, and this is time for Lessons Learned. And the person who I have on today is Lawrence Katz, and I haven't seen Lawrence in a very long time. Um, I think the last time I saw him, I was playing Barbie dolls with his sister, Cheryl. So this sort of takes you back down the path. But what surprised me, Larry, was when I saw on Facebook that you were a baseball fanatic. I don't remember really anybody in our neighborhood being baseball fanatics when we were growing up. They may have been. I was just oblivious to it. Um, and you have written numerous books on baseball. So let me begin by asking you, let's go back in the day, what got you interested in baseball? Well, first of all, let me, uh, I haven't really written many, many books on baseball. I've written one book, which I'm very proud of, which uh, focuses ar around the year 1939. Um, with the COVID, uh, and that was republished by the publisher, uh, originally published in 1995. And the publisher, which is McFarland and Company, which is a great uh, a publisher, and they're really devoted uh, to publishing uh, baseball history. And they've done that for decades, decided to republish it with a different cover in uh, 2012. And uh, with the COVID uh, and the opportunity that I had at home, um, I thought it would be a good idea to update and revise the book. I had... Uh, um, reserved the electronic rights to myself with the publisher and the publisher was okay with that back then. So I had the electronic rights and I thought, you know, this is an opportune time to revise the book, put it uh, out there in, uh, in ebook form um, using another title. Uh, the original title is, uh, was the, the publisher's title, Baseball in 1939, the Watershed Season of the National Pastime. And that was published by McFarland. Uh, twice. And then um, um, when I uh, got back the copyright for electronic purposes, I uh, recopyrighted it under the name uh, Summer of Change. So the two books, um, originally the, the book from um, 1995, I don't know if we can see that. that. Yep. That's the 1995 McFarland issue. And this is interesting because the cover, and it's also the cover of the uh, ebook is actually a photograph taken from the first baseball game ever televised, which was a college game in 1939. Interesting. It, was, it was televised. And uh, later that year, um, a Brooklyn Dodgers game was also televised uh, with the great Red Barber as the announcer. So uh, it was uh, the, that year was a seminal year for many, many events, but that's one of them. Sure. This is the uh, 2002 version. It has some minor changes in it, but it's, it's essentially the same as the original version. And then my, uh, my version is, uh, this is a print, printable uh, version of the ebook. And all of these books are available uh, at Amazon. This is obviously as an ebook is considerably cheaper than the publisher charges sure. for, the, you know, for the regular books. So, um, and I have been uh, lucky enough to have uh, written for Sports Collectors Digest, uh, Primo Magazine, um, uh, the Baseball Research Journal, and a number of other baseball uh, publications. But the actual, the, the actual books that really are a part of my life and my heart now would be the ones I just showed you. Okay. So how old were you when you knew that baseball was your game? You know, um, I I didn't I wasn't a baseball card collector. I was uh, really uh, um, not. You know, baseball in my in my childhood really was the game. Now that uh, sport is is really divided between the you know the four major sports. But back in the fifties and sixties, really it was all baseball. But I didn't really get into the game until. The first recollection I have of being fascinated by the game was actually 1961. And I was already at that time uh, 14 years old. Uh, so I'm giving my age away here. But, um, and my dad was talking to me about the Mickey Mantle, Roger Maris home run race. 
And he used that as a, uh, and he was a casual baseball fan. He wasn't a fanatic. He liked all the sports and he was explaining the game and this really interesting home run race between Roger Maris, who was kind of a, a newbie to uh, baseball greatness and Mickey Mantle, who had already been well known and was already well established as one of the great players of baseball history. And it was through that um, uh, prison that I began to uh, be fascinated with and, and I came to love the history of the game. And so at that point, I um, started to, I got uh, baseball uh, stats. I was, you know, definitely a stats nerd. You know, I, I was into that and I found that really you can't really love the game and hate the stats. Uh, there may be things about the stats, the metrics now that a lot of, that annoy a lot of baseball fans that think it's at the game, it hasn't been good for the game, but, but you have to like something about the, the stats, you know, it may, into batting average or on base percentage or something has to have some, it has no meaning. If the numbers don't have any meaning in the sport, I don't know how you can really love the sport because most sports revolve around, you know, a competition of numbers. Oh, absolutely. You know, and it's interesting because I think I shared with you offline, my youngest son is a baseball fanatic like you. Um, and he got introduced to baseball when he was about two years old. Um, I was traveling on business and my husband in the evening would get him all settled on the couch and they'd be watching TV and they started watching baseball. And one night he called me and he goes, mom, I love the Oreos. And I said, oh, dad bought you cookies? It was <laughs> baseball. And from that point on, he had to watch baseball. He really didn't understand it, but he watched it. And then as he got older, um, when he played, he wanted to play by the given rules of baseball. And of course, you don't do that in Little League. Um, and that would infuriate him why he had to hit a ball that was nowhere near him. Um, and so he sort of took a step back and he said, instead of playing the game, I'm going to actually learn the game. And he did. Um, and to this day, that is all he talks about. Uh, and in fact, you know, with COVID last year and, you know, the shorter season, you know, he started evaluating how anybody can really you know, make the numbers that they needed to, to get their standings. So uh, I, under, I understand the numbers. Uh, right. I don't crunch them, but I do listen to them. So when you decided to write this book, it was about the 1939 series. Season. Why 1939? Well, first of all, actually, having been familiar with a lot of the baseball literature, um, I discovered that not, and basically there, there have been book, many books written about, for instance, 1941, which was an important year because Ted Williams set a, 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 a batting uh, record. It wasn't really a record, but he hit the 400 batting average mark. Um, uh, Joe DiMaggio had his 56 game hitting streak. So a lot, there, there are a lot of uh, um, uh, uh, books and various uh, materials devoted to those years. But in particular, uh, there had been nothing devoted to a year that I thought was really very special. And so I thought it, it's ideal for my purposes to go ahead and uh, see if I could do something with that uh, year and actually write a book about it. And uh, it developed and gave me an opportunity to uh, become acquainted with a lot of the great players and personalities of that era who were still alive when I wrote the book. And that is the, one of the biggest thrills for me. And in particular, I was able to focus um, just simply by the graciousness of two particular personalities out of the Cleveland area to be able to focus on uh, Bob Feller and the great Mel Harder, who really doesn't get the publicity nationally that he deserved. And for me to be able to have interviewed those wonderful men um, and to be able to incorporate their stories in the, in the story of, of America uh, in the pre-war era, because their, their mindset, their experiences, their history, and their accomplishments really uh, are very integral 
to who we um, were as a nation um, in the Depression era and the pre-war in uh, pre pre-war United States. Sure. So it that was really um, an amazing experience, and that's something I I treasure as part of my life. The interviews I had with these all these wonderful players who are all gone now. Every single one is gone. And the sad part is most of our current players today, um, they don't want to give up their time to uh, have an interview. If they do, they want to be paid for it. Um, and it's really changed. I know back in the early, back in the 90s, my son used to go to every ball signing around. And the players were there. They would talk to you. Uh, they would take their picture with you. And now today to go to a ball signing, number one, if they even were to have one pre-pandemic, there was a, a huge charge just to even walk in the door. Um, so that, that has changed quite a bit because our youngsters don't have that same familiarity with the players like they used to. There, there is a distance. I will tell you two quick stories about the interviews. The, the, the story of the game and the, in the United States and the world as it existed then, that's incorporated in the book itself. So uh, I, I, don't, I don't think there's any need for me sure. to go through the details of the book itself, but I will give you some, uh, just two quick side stories that kind of um, um, capsulized. I think they're emblematic of what you just said. And, and I will give you two. Uh, first of all, I interviewed numerous players, including several Hall of Famers, uh, Bob Feller only being one of them, uh, uh, Monty Irvin, uh, uh, Ernie Harwell, many, many great, uh, who's a great personality, great broadcaster uh, back uh, decades, uh, decades ago. And really his longevity lasted uh, you know, until fairly recent times. Two stories, nobody asked me for any, any money Nobody wanted any, any remuneration, but there are two exceptions. And I think they're, they're, they're interesting um, commentaries on, uh, on humanity generally. Um, there was one who, and he's a Hall of, he's a, oh, he was a retired Hall of Famer and his father was an attorney, um, I'm embarrassed to say. And I got, even when the players turned me down for interviews, many times I got, beautiful letters from them, which I cherish, some of them very funny letters, uh, some ironic, but in any event, I, I have these and, and, and I treasure them. But I one that I do have, still have here, but it, I'm not sure that I put it in the same category, is a letter from this Hall of Famer's father who was, who was an attorney. And the letter said, basically, you're making money on this book, and I'm, I'm, I'm here representing my father and my father's not going to give an interview unless you pay him. And, um, you know, that, that, that kind of hurt, you know, um, it, it, uh, I, I was, I don't know if he, you know, thinks that these books make uh, us writers <laughs> uh, multimillionaires, but whatever, that's one, you know, one experience. The other one was, the only other request was from the great Monty Irvin and a, a great hall of famer. And he said, I will give you an interview on one condition. I want you to make a contribution to the scholarship of my alma mater, Lincoln University. And then I'll give you the interview. And I said, well, how will you know when I make the contribution? Do you want me to uh, send you a copy of the check or what do you want me to do? He says, no, I, I'm going to believe you. Just I'm going to hang up now. Call me back when you've made your contribution. You tell me you have, and I'll give you the interview. And that's what happened. And I got one of the most wonderful interviews from him about his life um, and the discrimination he suffered, um, his, his life in the Negro Leagues, and his uh, having been promoted. It's not really a promotion. You know, we recognize the Negro Leagues now as being equal to the major leagues. His transition to the uh, major leagues, and it's a wonderful story that's embodied uh, and, and woven into the fabric of my book on that era. I love that. You know, as I also shared with you, um, my son had met uh, Bob Feller twice. The first time he went to a ball signing with his grandmother and his grandmother was a five foot tiny, not just in, you know, height, but all around very tiny woman. 
and they walked in together. And I think he was about nine years old. And uh, he said, I'm with my grand. Could you sign a ball for me and for her? And he talked to them for about 10 minutes. About five years later, we're at the Hall of Fame. We're walking through. And I spot Bob Feller out of the corner of my eyes. So I say to my son, there's Bob Feller. He goes, oh, I can't bother him. I said, I would just go up and say hello. And he did. And Bob Feller looked at him and he was eyeing him up and down. He goes, I remember you. I met you in Akron, Ohio at a ball signing and you were with your grandmother. And it started this 10 minute conversation, just Alex and Bob Feller. My husband and I stood on the opposite side. So we were not involved. And that to him has been the most important day of his life uh, because Bob Feller didn't have to give him even a minute of his time. He could have acknowledged him and kept going. So there are some great people that are out there. And I'm so glad that he gave you an interview for your book. And uh, we have ordered the book because Alex says now he has to read it. So, I appreciate it. So here you are, you went to school, you have your degree in law. So where did you find time to do all the things with baseball being a lawyer? I mean, come on, you've got a lot of more important things to do. Well, the way my office was structured is I did litigation and uh, I'm semi-retired now. I'm still working. I, I'm still practicing law, but not in the way I did for the major for decades in the majority of my career. Uh, basically, what I would do is I would do trial work and litigation. I had a general practice, but I also had an appellate practice. And you really can't write briefs in the middle of the day. It is, you can't do much research at all. It isn't uh, uh, a, a kind of a, a cerebral kind of process like that. It doesn't allow for it. So I would do my work during the day regarding my litigation. And when I would go home, I would do my, uh, my appellate work. And I love to write, obviously. Uh, I don't know if it's obvious, but I, I, I really do love the, just the experience and the process of writing. And I would write my briefs in the evening. And so as I transitioned to the decision to write uh, more inten you know, intense, intensely, intensively, I decided um, that I had to give up the appellate side because there would be no room. So what I would do in the evenings and the weekends, which is write briefs and memoranda, I gave that up for about a year and a half after I had collected uh, my primary materials. And that's when, for about a year and a half after I had collected my primary, primary materials, that's when I would sit down and write. So there, I was able to basically work during the, do my legal work during the day. And then I was able to uh, write this book over a fairly long, relatively long period of time on the weekends and in the evenings. So it did work out well. And then when I finished the book, I started picking back up uh, my criminal appellate work, which is important to me too. So I, I managed to get it done. I'm not sure um, whether I was the best uh, best uh, husband and father during that period of time, whether I'd spent too much time uh, with myself and my work. I hope that I was able to manage my family too, because that comes first. But that's what I endeavored to do. And somehow uh, a product came out of it. Managing. And a great experience is that I, you know, I've been relating to you. Sure. So there's some changes coming this year in baseball. Okay. One is a smaller baseball. Do you know about that? No, I, you know, I, you know, as a, I, I consider myself a baseball historian, unofficial historian as such, but in terms of keeping up with a lot of the developments of the game and being a you know fan um, of any particular team uh, or obsessed with a, a particular uh, championship race, um, I'm not, uh, I'm not an expert in that area. Uh, this is the first I'm learning. I've heard that they're going to keep the runner on second in extra yeah. innings. I've heard that in double headers, um, it'll be seven, uh, seven inning games. Right. But in changing the uh, size of the baseball, 
I'm hearing this for the uh, for the first time. So, so you can tell me. Okay, so they're changing the size of the baseball and the weight of the baseball is going to be lighter to prevent as many home runs. They think this is going to help speed up the game. Um, so we were having a conversation about it last night and I said, you keep changing and I understand life evolves and I know we go through changes, but I like the purity of the game and it makes me sad to see some of these changes, especially the runner on second. I don't like that. And that's just a personal opinion. So, um, I don't think it, I don't think it speeds up the game at all. In fact, sometimes I think it slows it down a little bit. No, I don't know if there's data on how that worked um, last year. And I suspect that after COVID, at least, at least the runner on second will be dispensed with because the, the concern, as I understand it, is they just don't want these players out there uh, for 18 inning games. Right. And they think that that will reduce the likelihood that they're going to play too many more uh, innings after, after nine. Yep. Um, so I think that's probably um, not here to stay. The ball, obviously, obviously is, that's troubling because that's, you know, the dimensions, et cetera, have been basically in place for a long time, although there's been a lot of suspicion over the years that they've been tinkering with it to increase uh, the, uh, um, the ability of players to hit home runs or to reduce them, et cetera, et cetera. I, I do think that uh, the... The Society, uh, the Society for, for American Baseball Research that I've been a member of since 1983 and, and were very uh, helpful to me in, in terms of being able to begin a research career in baseball. I'm not sure that their analytics stress that really this stress has been incorporated into baseball and the baseball world now accepts that uh, batting average isn't as important, that on-base percentage is more important, which means um, uh, base on balls are far more important uh, than they used to be. And uh, the power hitting and driving in runs, scoring runs are more important than base hits. But I think the fan, um, for the players to just sit back and continually try to launch a ball out of there, and if they strike out, nobody cares. And so we see these player players with 200 strikeouts, right. uh, they're hitting uh, 190 a batting average, and hitting 39 home runs, driving in 85 runs, that's considered a great year, and they get 20 million a year for it. But I'm not sure that the fan uh, is getting as much um, sport, and they're getting as much excitement out of the game. And I know I sound like some of the players I interviewed that really, you know, would talk, and I tried to tamp down a lot of that in the book so that uh, the book wouldn't be filled with players like Ty Cobb uh, was known for by complaining all the time that all the players are trying to hit home runs. And, and in his day, they, 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 were, you know, they, they were out there trying to score uh, runs based on base hits and stolen bases. And that kind of, that kind of uh, rhetoric gets boring. We've heard it before. We don't need that. But on the other hand, we want some sort of balance. And I think in some ways, they do need to do something about the pace of the game. Sure. I'm not sure changing the, the you know, the, the, the baseball is the best way to, to go about it, though. Well, we're going to wait and see what happens this year. And since you mentioned Ty Cobb, um, another story that I'd love to share is that my grandfather and his brother uh, were part of a barnstorming uh, league back in the day. And that was before Ty Cobb was signed. And so Ty Cobb was playing on the same team. And my grandfather and his brother did this for months. And they were being scouted. They came home and they told my great grandmother and they said, we are so lucky. We are being scouted and we may become professional baseball players. And their mother looked at the two of them and said, only bums play baseball. And she made sure that they didn't have the free time to go back to the team. Um, and I learned this very late in my grandfather's life. And I thought, no, you know, this is just some story he's telling me. Uh, 
but I have a cousin who does a lot of research and she and Alex did some studies and they found them on a barnstorming roster. And uh, so I think that's why baseball is sort of in my blood. Uh, that's a, that's I, a great story. That's, you know, it is so exciting to know. I mean, we, when he went, when my son went to the baseball hall of fame two years ago, he was um, escorted into the archives room and uh, he found it even in the archives room and they allowed him to take a picture with his phone with no flash. Um, so we know it exists and uh, it's sort of exciting, but yet as a young kid, uh, other than saying I was rooting for the Tigers because I was from Detroit, baseball meant nothing to me. So, but what a great experience for your son. Though. Yes. Um, it's just one more notch that he can, you know, say that he's accomplished and it can connect to. That is something special that the game has, that people can establish personal connections with the game. They don't have to be players. There are so many different ways that you can connect in a, in a interpersonal way with the game, with the game's personalities, with the players, it is an experience. It really is uh, an American experience and it's very unique to the sport of baseball and very unique to our country. Uh, and that really distinguishes this game from uh, any other. It's it, the way in which it resonates in our souls, in our brain, in our heart. And it can do that and it still can do that. As much as it's changed, it does have that special quality. I know it has for me my whole life. Absolutely. So do you have another book in you? Um, actually, I'm writing something uh, on a subject completely unrelated to uh, baseball. Um, okay. I have written um, in other areas, articles, etc. And I am working on something that's really very ambitious, too ambitious. I've, 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 it's been a work in progress for years. And uh, it, 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 it has to do with American history generally. But, you know, the more I the more I get into it, the more I realize I'm probably over my head and I'm probably at some point gonna have to reach out um, for some help from some people that are, uh, I consider really true historians and uh, perhaps they can uh, give me a hand up and uh, I can get that accomplished. So that's what I'm doing now. Well, I'm really excited that we got to talk about the book. You wanna hold it up one more time so we can- Yes, this is the- um, this was the uh, 1995 version that's available on Amazon. It, you would have to ask for the 1995 version. This, and it's again, published by McFarland and Company. This is the 2012 version. This is a printable copy of the ebook. All of these uh, um, works are available. Um, um, on, on Amazon. I also have, and it's available, I have a chapter um, in a book uh, that was published many years ago and it's still available. This one is published by Barnes and Noble um, <clears throat> and by um, Taylor Publishing Company. And it's an anthology with wonderful baseball stories, including um, a, uh, an article by the great Lawrence Ritter who wrote a seminal book called The Glory of Their Times, which is considered by some people as the greatest baseball book ever written. Yes, not baseball in 1939. Um, and I'm proud to have a book, uh, a, a, an article in this uh, beautiful anthology as well. So um, I, these are, uh, these, these books are like my children. Uh, I, 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 I bring them here, but they're, 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 there's no room for them in this, uh, in this uh, program. So <laughs> the next best thing I have are these things. How wonderful. Well, again, we want to thank you very much. Thank you for uh, having me. Oh, it's been wonderful. I feel like I'm back on at your house in Sa <laughs> Santa Barbara. Well, come, uh, come to Michigan and, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll have some coffee and, uh, and, I, a, and a beer or some pizza. Hey, sounds good. Well, hopefully COVID will be over within the year. I just got to pray that it will be. You'll be uh, our first guest. I love it. Say hi to your sisters for me. I will. Uh, take care. And again, thank you very much. Thank you, Karen, for having me. I loved it.
Thank you. Bye-bye now. Okay. Bye.